morning, everybody. Why don't we go ahead and stand? We're going to worship the Lord tonight. Father, you are welcome in this place. We acknowledge your presence, that your glory is all around us tonight, Father, that we did lay down the day at the feet of the cross, Jesus, and we just welcome you with a sacrifice of praise. Oh, would you lift your hands with me and just welcome him in the room? Oh, we welcome you, Jesus. Oh, a sacrifice of praise is what I bring to you. Have it all tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, let's sing this out tonight. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. Yes, I
Hallelujah, Father. Praise your mighty name. Oh, we welcome you in this place, Holy Spirit. Have your way in us. Praise your mighty name, Father God. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Oh, we welcome your spirit. Thank you for your healing power. Thank you for the power on your name working in us. Oh, we glorify and praise you. We honor and celebrate you. We worship you. Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Welcome to church tonight. Why don't you turn and greet somebody? Shake a hand and give a smile and face.
Amen. Praise God. Praise God. It's good to be here tonight. We're blessed to have you. Those watching online, welcome to church. Amen. Well, we uh, before we get into uh, the, the word tonight, I want to give you an opportunity to give your tithes and offerings. Ushers, if you wouldn't mind being in the aisles with your envelopes, if you'd like to give tonight, raise your hand. The ushers would be happy to help you. You can give online if you're watching. want to do that here. Um, you can see the different ways that you can do that on the screen. Um, I want to remind you, um, you know, I mentioned this uh, in Galatians uh, a few weeks back, but in Romans it talks about the same thing, and we find uh, Paul on his way to Rome, and he's writing a letter to the church in Rome, and he's saying in Romans 15, uh, verse 25, but before I come to you in Rome, I must go to Jerusalem to take a gift to the believers there. For you see, the believers in Macedonia and Acadia have eagerly taken up an offering for the poor among the believers in Jerusalem. Now, this isn't talking about, you know, the homeless. In Jerusalem at this time, they have been under heavy persecution. And the early church in Jerusalem had at one time not been poor. They, you read about that in Acts, how they were coming together and bringing the selling possessions and uh, the unity that was in the church. But then it had come under persecution. And they were facing a lot of adversity in their life. And so he's talking about giving to their situation. Not just poor people. I'm sure Macedonia had plenty of poor people too. But they were giving to their need for a reason. And this is what I want you to see tonight. He says, they were glad to do this because they feel they owe a debt to them. Since the Gentiles received the spiritual blessings of the good news from the believers in Jerusalem, they feel they, the least they can do, I'm reading this out of the uh, New Living, it says the least they can do in return is to help them financially. And why am I saying that? Because I'm connecting the fact that when you are fed spiritually, when you receive spiritual food, that, that it is biblical to respond in a natural way. Your giving tonight shouldn't just be from a place of obligation or duty or, you know, just this sense of religious thing, but it's really a response. Think of the things that you have learned and grown and are being fed from the spiritual things in this church. And your tithes and your givings should be a response to that. And you should connect those things, not just, you know, pastor did a good job. Okay, well, respond to that. All right. You know, when somebody ministers to you in a spiritual way, you can connect to that spiritual blessing in a physical way. Galatians talks about the same thing. When we have ministers who come and teach us, we should help them. That's what we do. Part of our giving contributes not only to the provision of the church, but also to those of us who study the word for your half. I'm not up here for my own sanity. You know, I'm up here because I believe God wants to help you to grow in a spiritual way. I'm not up here teaching, you know, principles of you know, how to balance your checkbook tonight. Tonight we're going to talk about how to mop your floors. That's not what I'm here to do. I don't, you don't need me and I don't need to do that. You know, I'm not reading out of the newspaper and we're having a commentary about the war in Israel. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to feed on God's word. We're here to let his spirit speak to us. We're here to open our hearts and minds. And in doing so, over the times of coming and coming and coming, part of the response that you have is not just the altar or even in your own heart. Here we're told there's also a, should be an expectation or a joy to give because of what you're receiving. And I'm not saying that to motivate you to do anything. I'm just reminding you that as much as our giving is done out of a willing heart and full of joy and in faith and all of the things that are required of that, there's also the just simple response, thank you, Father, for what I have learned and am growing and understanding. And that giving is as much a thank you to the Lord and a response to that as anything else. And I want to say thank you for your faithfulness to give. Because you are a good giving church. And we are a good giving church to those in need. I want to thank all of you that uh, took the families out there in the, in the lobby. I think we had 14 or 15 families. The school superintendent here in Coweta called the church and was looking for churches to help with needy families in the school. 
And so the girls reached out, and Laura and Jennifer did all the labor, and Chrissy, and um, we connected to these families that have children that are financially, you know, the families are in need. And so there's churches, you know, throughout the community, but I think we had 15, 14, 15 families. And so um, I think they're all gone, right? Is that right? Yeah, so thank you. You know, uh, Proverbs says that when you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. So don't just go buy it for some smiley little, who can say no to that face? Remember that the need that they have is an opportunity for you to lend to the Lord. So when you're blessing those kids, bring it back in faith. Amen? When you're here and you're receiving and God's speaking to your life, it's okay to respond in the natural. You're not buying something from God. If he felt it was buying, he wouldn't be putting it in this way. They were simply responding to God's blessing in their life. Amen? So you ready to give? I know you are because you're all watching me. Hallelujah. Let's hold it up to the Lord. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for the wisdom and revelation of your word. Thank you for the growth that we are participating and partaking of from the feeding on the word daily and weekly and in this church. And we respond, Father God, in our giving tonight. And we are generous and thankful and grateful for the growth and the continuation of that growth in the family and in our homes and in our lives. And we ask for your blessing of favor and grace and wisdom and increase as they are honoring you and your word tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Ushers, go ahead and pass out those buckets. Thank you to you, you guys, you three. I forgot about you over there. Thank you. Great job. Amen. Praise God. God is a good God. The name of Jesus is a powerful name. We're going to talk about the Lordship of Jesus on Sunday morning, but tonight we are going to continue talking about healing by looking at God's divine healing being spiritual. And this is important. You know, I wish... I honestly wish I could just teach this same lesson for about five or six weeks. Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, just so that it can really sink in because this is key. Any healing done by God always is done first in the spirit before it ever shows up in the flesh and it manifests in a physical way. It has to be, begin and be received in the spirit. Think of it like this. <clears throat> Medical science, doctors, aid healing through physical means. In other words, what do they do? They administer medicine. And they do it in a physical way to your physical body. But not one medicine you have does anything until you take it. Them giving it to you, you knowing about it, you understanding what it does to you, never changes anything. That reality of understanding is not how medicine works. We get that, right? You have to consume it. You have to put it in your body so that it can break down and go to work and do what it's supposed to do. That is the way we physically know how to deal with 
sickness and pain, right? Sickness and pain cannot be done by lighting certain candles. It might help your mood, might smell a certain way, but it's not a cure. It might even mask something. You can rub an oil on your body and it might calm something down, but it didn't cure it. But that's a physical way of dealing, and I'm not telling you get rid of your essential oils. That's not what I'm saying. I'm simply saying it's all physical. It's just what we know to do in the natural, and we all accept that. And we have a tremendous amount of faith in that. People really live most of their life dependent on the simple truth that the doctor is what's going to keep me alive. And if it wasn't for the doctor, as my dad always said, there'd be a lot of good Christians gone if it wasn't for good doctors. So I'm not preaching against medicine. I'm simply saying that it's all done in a physical way, and we believe in that and accept that. And yet, when it comes to healing, divine healing, God's healing, why is it so hard to believe that it can and does come from the Spirit? We can accept it from a pill. Why can't we accept it from the Spirit? It's administered. Healing is administered like a pill administers help. The spirit administers help. Your human spirit is where healing comes from. It does not come from the outside in. It comes from the inside out. Laying on of hands is a point of contact. But healing always comes from the spirit. Are you hearing me? Even when it's a person who is healing someone that's an unbeliever. It's from the revelation they have in their own spirit about healing. When you look at the healing evangelists of, of old, Brother Roberts and Catherine Kuhlman and these men and women that had incredible gifts of healings, that all came from the Holy Ghost. That all came through their spirit, their time in the presence of God developed and built in them such an understanding and a belief that healing is ours and it is divine from God, but it came from them. But now that you are a born-again believer, that same work can happen through you. And that's where many of us are challenged to receive healing. We're looking for someone who's there to do the work for us. It's like, I want healed, but you take my medicine. That's literally what we do most of the time when it comes to spiritual healing. We're looking for someone else who has gotten the revelation and let them do the work of me getting healed. So in other words, you're wanting them to do the labor, then take the medicine and you get the cure. Well, that would be foolish. But yet many of us in our spiritual life are dependent on other people's faith and understanding of healing to receive and to be healed. When that is not God's best, thank God for it. It is a gift a gift of healings is a work of the nine manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We don't diminish that. But that work is as He wills. Healing and health is a spiritual benefit of salvation. It is a right. It is a privilege as sons and daughters of God. It is not exclusive to certain men and women. Thank God He again sends those to us. But we should not have to live dependent on those situations. Psalms 107 verse 20 says he sent his word and healed them. His word and delivered them from their destruction. So how did he heal and deliver? From his word. The word of God was the key. I'm going somewhere tonight and I want you to really pay attention. It didn't say that God sent his word to heal. But he sent his word to and healed. See, the work is done. It's past tense. As far as God is concerned, healing is an already done thing in Christ. We got to get that truth in us. We got to medicate our heart, our spirit with that reality that healing is divine. It is of God and it is provided for. You have been medicated with healing in Jesus. Proverbs 4, verse 20 and 22, give attention to my word. Incline your ear to my saints. Don't let it depart from your eyes. Keep it in the midst of your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to all their flesh. 
That is talking about your physical body. In case we want to religiousize that right out of reality, it means the body, physical things. It's health to your flesh. Notice that God's word is life. But notice it's also health. It's medicine, some translations say. Medicine to your flesh. We are literally medicating our spirit with the word of God. I want healed. Lay hands on me. Read the word. Incline yourself to the word. Put it in your eyes and your ears. Don't let it depart from your mind. What am I doing? Medicating, medicating, medicating what? My heart, my spirit. Because that's where it's going to come from. It's going to come through me and the Holy Spirit inside of me who's bringing revelation and life to this word I'm feeding on. And it's going to cause transformation, life and health to my flesh. God's word will heal your body. But he's going to do it through the spirit first. It's going to come from the inside out. So many times we believe it when we feel it or see it. That's the Thomas kind of faith. What did Jesus say to Thomas? It's better to believe without seeing than to believe after you see it. This is what we're talking about. We have to believe in our hearts that healing is our right. It's not an earned thing. And if we're not manifesting that reality in our life, we need to feed on the Word. So many times we're feeding on the Word about a thousand other things and and not on our bodies, not on our health, not on life. We're reading the Word about, you know, end times. We spend years studying about the rapture. You're sick. The rapture is irrelevant when you're on your deathbed. I mean, you're hearing me like... I should be studying and meditating and filling my life with healing, health, life. That's why we have the things in the library that we have, to help you. Come on. If you're broke, not poor, but broke, you don't have any money, poor is a whole different level than broke, right? I'm going to assume you understand the difference. If you don't, we'll talk about it later. But broke... If you're broke, the answer is not keep doing the same thing and hoping something changes. And we would understand that. In the natural, if I had no money, I wouldn't then go spend money. That's called debt. But in reality, for many of us, we just want to keep doing the same thing and hope things will change. So we, we, we know about healing. We listen to people preach about healing, but we won't do it for ourselves. We want somebody else to do the medicating. And here we are told it is your responsibility. You must receive the word concerning healing in your spirit. Psalms 19 verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect. God's word is perfect spiritual law. It's a supernatural medicine. Here's the thing, you ever taken too much medicine or the wrong medicine? Boy, your body don't like that. It does not like that. There is no possibility of over-medicating yourself or wrongly medicating yourself with the Word of God. It's perfect. It works through the human spirit, and it is a spiritual cure. But like other medicines, it's got to be regularly applied. And you're the only one that can talk to your regular What does your regular life look like? What is the regular work of your day, your evening? Someone else can't do what you are required to do for yourself. I can't take your medicine and you get better. It's no different with God. In James 1.21, therefore lay aside filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness. The implanted word which is able to save your soul. I'm always surprised at how annoyed people get when you preach something that is a touching their, their flesh. How easily offended people are for the word. It's the Bible. It's God. His spirit is talking and you know it is. And what do we do? We get touchy. He says, with meekness, receive it. Why are we so offensive and touchy? Because we don't want to lay it aside. 
I don't want you talking to me about the things I enjoy doing. And you're telling me I have to lay those aside. I'm not. The Bible is. The Bible is saying when you can't lay aside something for the implanted word, it is an overflow of wickedness in your life. It has too much power over you when you can't set it aside for the word to be implanted in your life. If you can't receive God's word because I've always been sick, if you can't receive God's word, the implanted word, with a humility, a humbleness, in other words, all your excuses have to be laid aside to receive. His word says, by his stripes I am healed. You'd be surprised how hard that is for people to actually allow that truth to be received. I'm not saying they don't believe it. I'm saying they won't receive it. They won't lay aside their doubt. I am quite certain when Thomas heard of Jesus raised from the dead, everything in his being wanted that to be true. I do not believe he could possibly Stand there and say what he said out of a place of pride. In his own way, he wanted it. He just could not get past his unbelief. The reality of that truth was too big for his mind to conceive. And so many of us, our mind gets in the way of our capacity to receive what we're hearing tonight. Healing is not withheld from you. It is not some truth in heaven. Stop asking God to heal you from the place of of eternity. He's done it on the inside. Receive it. Let the implanted meekness of God's word be deposited and lay aside all those arguments and those filthinesses and those overflows of the wickedness of the world, unbelief, your religious tradition, that garbage that says it passed away. Or it's only talking about salvation. I'm telling you that is a wicked thing. To rob the work of Christ because of man's religion. Fear is what it is. It's really fear. What if they're right and I'm wrong? What does that mean? Who cares if I'm right or wrong? Is that the point? I'm sick. And I don't want to be sick. So I'm going to let my stubbornness, my tradition... It's wicked. I don't want to interfere with who he is. We have to receive it with meekness. Humble ourselves. Submit to the authority and the truth. Jesus said in John 15, 7, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Everyone wants to get what they pray for, but very few are willing to abide in Jesus to see it come to pass. If you abide, see it's conditional. We all love this idea of, you know, asking it'll be done for me, but it's a condition. There's no free ride. You read anything in the Bible that doesn't require effort, I would challenge your doctrine on that. There is no free ride. Even salvation requires effort, contrary to what others believe. It's crystal clear. you got to believe in your heart and say with your mouth. Not denying the power of salvation is for everybody, but everybody has to respond. Okay? So that response continues in all the other things. It's not like I responded one time, the rest is free. No, no. I keep abiding and receiving and responding and abiding. And because I live that way... There's where I get what I ask for. My desires are changed. Because I'm not desiring something of my flesh. Because the abiding changed my desires. Satan is who hinders our prayers. Because he's hindering our abiding in Christ. Distractions, flesh, anger, strife, bitterness. These things get memories of the past. They get in the way of abiding in Jesus. Other believers. You, I can't believe how many people are on, on social media. You know, you know, you're just scrolling through your board, you know, and you're just flipping through it. How many people are just disgruntled about church 
and Christians. Like, how can you tell me your life is better without those things when we are told in the word that you are not to forsake those things? Don't talk to me about that. You're just offended and mad at somebody. And you're in that feel-good season that you are righteous indignation. And yet we do this all the time in our lives. We get angry and frustrated. <clears throat> not, not a few people have come and gone through church, this church. Because when the word gets in that, in that spot, oh, they just they can't adapt. They, you know why? They're not abiding outside the doors. When you're abiding in Christ, when you're in his word, when you're meditating on it, and you're filling your ears and your mind, when God makes an adjustment, you're like, yes, sir. Thank you for that correction. Thank you for that adjustment. If you're like offended by everything and touchy by everything, that's not the preacher and the people's fault. And no, we're not perfect. And yes, we are probably really good at offending and upsetting. But is it for the word? Is it from the word? I'm not up here just talking about how much I do or don't like you. You would have a right to be offended if I did that. Stand up. It's all about you today. I would probably punch you just like you would want to punch me. And you would have probably every right. That's not what we're doing here. We're talking about the spirit of God speaking to our spirit that we need to remove the hindrances and we need to stop medicating ourselves improperly and we need to recognize it is our responsibility to abide in Christ, to meditate on his word because that comes a feeding of the spirit which is a whole other sermon and from that is where health and life comes from. Carnality keeps a lot of people from abiding. What's carnality? Carnality is just flesh. Living according to the flesh. Driven by flesh. What's the flesh? Your five physical senses. So when you're constantly driven by your five senses, then you are not abiding in Christ. Because to abide in Christ will contradict everything the senses want to tell you. Take a nap. Fall asleep. He's preaching hard. He's preaching soft. He's loud. He's not loud enough. I'm used to this. I like that. They didn't sing my song. All carnal. All flesh. Now we're here, but we're not here. So when his spirit is gathered, we're not here to gather with it. Abiding is not a religious term. It's the condition of your lifestyle. Verse by verse. Throughout God's word, it tells us there are conditions to requests being granted by God. When we are abiding in Jesus, his word abides in us. Our desires change and things change in us. Our asks change. Our requests change. Our words change. Our thoughts change. Our attitudes change. And in that change, you're going to get what you ask for. His word promises us that. This is not promising that God changes to accommodate us, but rather we change to accommodate God. And that's the real key to health. It's changing our approach to the way we receive it. James 1.21, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness. That's what we read earlier. Well, if you go back and look at 1 Peter 2.1, or you go back and read Colossians 3.8, I don't have time to do that. It tells us what exactly we should lay aside. And those verses say we should lay aside all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, evil speaking. Have you done any of that lately? Let's just look down at our phones, please. But now you yourself are to put off these things. You, you, not the preacher, not the spirit, not God, not the Bible. You, you have to put off anger and wrath and malice and blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Lay aside. Why? They hinder the conception of spirit in your life. They will hinder life in you. They will hinder health and healing from your spirit. Those things will keep the life of God that is deposited in you from coming out. It's like, listen... If you have diabetes and you have to take insulin, 
Okay, you take insulin, right, to keep you from having low or high, you know, blood sugar. I don't have it, so I just know you got to regulate yourself, right? So you don't do that so you can keep spending the rest of your life cheating, right? Am I right? Yes, it's to help you. Sin, does, carnality does the same thing. We want to live carnal and be healed. Well, how are you feeding on the Word and then living in the carnality of it? It's like injecting yourself and then eating something that messes with your sugar. You can't do both things. Bitter water and sweet water can't reside in the same well. You're the decider. Hear me. You are the decider of what's in your well. <clears throat> Excuse me. You have to make the choice for yourself. What am I putting in? What am I allowing out? Lay it aside, lay it aside, lay it aside. Oh, please hear what I'm saying. We would much rather have Catherine Kuhlman lay hands on us. <laughs> but I want to see us walk in health. You know, I'm not preaching this stuff to sound smart. I'm preaching this so the Spirit of God will deal with us. <clears throat> and we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what? I do need to change. I do need to make the dis the difficult decision to say no to myself. You know why it's difficult? Let's be honest. Do you know why any decision you make is hard? You don't want to do it. That's all it is. Once you decide you're going to do something, it's the easiest decision you ever made because you decided to do it. It's doing it when you really don't want to do it. Thank you for that great revelation, but it's good anyways. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 12, 35, a good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good things. Good and evil doesn't start with an idea. It starts in the heart. He says here, out of the heart. So you just let that thing fester and fester and fester. It didn't just accidentally happen. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of the evil treasure. So the key here is, what are we treasuring? The things we treasure have fruit. The things we treasure in our life bear evil or good. So ask yourself, what do you treasure? What do you find important? What do you value? If you would treasure God's word, the way you treasure that medicine, you might see some transformation of good and evil. And I don't know about you, but God did not design us to live on pills. And don't kid yourself. We all know most of the, the sicknesses in the world were cured a long time ago. But they can't make any money on cured. So they just keep you cured enough not to die, but sick enough you got to keep taking it. That's not how healing works, by the way. Jesus didn't go to the cross to heal you enough so you just keep coming to church. Not totally, just enough you got to keep coming. No, that's not how this works. I determine how much it works or don't work. Not him at all. My healing has nothing to do with what Christ does. It's what he did. And so the fullness of that work is determined by me. Me, what will I lay aside? What am I abiding in? What will I discipline myself to do? Will I get rid of this garbage in my life and stop letting others tell me I'm justified in it? Words are carriers of faith. <clears throat> Hebrews 11.3, the worlds were framed by God's word. The word out of God's mouth framed the world. Your world is framed exactly the way you have spoken to it. You don't like the world you live in. I'm not talking about the world universally or the world in America. I'm talking about your life. The world you live in every day. The people in it. The people you associate with. The people you have to be around. That world is framed by your words. Life or death is in the power of your tongue. Again, it's personal responsibility to be a doer. We're talking about spiritually receiving healing. That healing is a spiritual thing. 
every time you speak your faith, it creates a stronger image inside of you. <clears throat> if, if it's healing you want, then that image of healing created by God's word and continually affirmed and agreed with by your mouth, eventually that image will be perfected by that word of God that you are meditating on and speaking and believing, and you will begin to see yourself the way the Bible sees you and God sees you. As I said Sunday morning, you got to start seeing yourself the way God sees you in Christ. And that's what we're talking about. I have to see myself the way God sees me, healthy, alive, whole, soundness of spirit, soul, and body. I can't know that in some general way. I have to abide in that every day, every moment, every word, every thought. i got to lay aside things that would strip it and rob it of me. If i got to get people out of my life that want to keep me broken sick, they have to go. Are you hearing me? I don't need to tell you that. You need to know that. You need to value your health coming from God more than you value the opinions of others. Because they will influence you. Don't, don't kid yourself. Do you know, let's, let's just be honest. Most of the things that we have to lay aside don't even happen by ourselves. They happen because of everybody else. I don't, I don't remember cussing myself out. I don't stand in the mirror and just cuss at myself. Oh boy, I have laid a few good ones down for people and I felt righteously cured for saying it for about 30 seconds. Oh gosh, that felt really good. And then I think, that was not good at all. But for a second, my carnality just got the better of me. Why? Because i got to live in a world full of people that anger me and frustrate me. So why do I want to continue to have that in my life? Don't I love and value what God wants me to be more than to just, you know, well, it's a, it's a test for me, Pastor. No, it's not. God did not test you by bringing those people into your life. He didn't. Do you know the entire time that Jesus had Judas around him. He knew he was a thief. He knew he was going to do all of that stuff, and yet he kept him around. It wasn't some kind of test. Well, maybe I can change him. That wasn't Jesus' motive at all. Jesus knew exactly what was going on with every one of those 12. He decided who was in his life. Even when his moms and his brothers got annoyed with him. Who are they except those who do my word? Come on. When God's word concerning healing takes root in your flesh, it becomes greater than disease. Healing is a result of what you are meditating on, what you are believing in, what you are saying, what you are laying aside, what you are committing yourself to. Well, we don't like to think about that for healing. You know what that is, right? Everything I've said is summarized in one big word. It's called change. We have to change. Just lay hands on me. Get that bottle of oil. It said if you just anoint me, you'd, I'd be fine. Thank God it does say that, but I'm not talking about a one-time experience. I'm talking about living healed, living whole, living healthy. Do you know Brother Hagen said this, that... Many of the people that got healed within three to five years of them receiving it, they lost it. That's not healing. That's, that's medication. That's temporary relief. You know why they lost it? Well, Brother Hagen wasn't real. No, it wasn't it at all. They wouldn't abide. Exactly what I'm talking about, they did not do. They went right back to the things they did. I'm healed. And they lost it. It's a life of effort if we're going to see things different in our life. Complaining about it, blaming it on others, all, all that may be true, will not fix your situation. It just justifies why you aren't better. John 6.63, it is the Spirit who gives life. 
The flesh profits nothing. That does not mean the flesh don't profit from the Spirit. What he's saying is, when you do everything by the flesh, it is not going to profit you. Your profit in life comes from living by the Spirit. It's the Spirit that gives life, not the flesh that gives life. The flesh don't give life. The flesh receives it by the Spirit. The word I speak to you are Spirit, and they are life. The, the words, the words I speak, Jesus is talking here. Our physical man receives life from food. Our spiritual man receives life as we partake of the bread of life, Jesus. As we partake of Jesus, as we partake of his words. You know, most of the, from Acts to the right in the Bible, is simply the revelation of what Jesus did in the Gospels. All Paul's doing is explaining what really happened. They didn't catch it or see it until the Holy Ghost came. And then the second chapter of Acts, the Holy Ghost shows up, and Paul goes and spends 10 years on the backside of the desert, and all his Jewish knowledge comes to life. And all the old becomes new. All the revelation of what the Old Testament was prophesying to, Jesus fulfilled, and then Paul explains it to us. It's all about Jesus. All the revelation in the Pauline epistles is simply telling us what we have and who we are in Christ. Rights and privileges. Authority. Jesus is got the keys to death and hell. The devil is under our feet. We have authority and power over what? Principalities, powers, mights, and demons. All of that stuff happened because of Jesus. My healing comes from Jesus. Feeding on Jesus. They sang about the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has authority and power. You know why I can exercise that name? Do you know why I believe the name of Jesus? It's not because it's spelled uniquely or it's a Hebrew word. It's not the, the, the verbiage of the word at all. It's who he was. He could have been called Cat. If that's what God told Mary to name him, and we'd be going around, cat has healed us. It's not about the four or five letters. It's about him. It's about who he is. It's about his life. It's not some religious thing hanging on your neck. It's understanding. It's meditating. It's speaking. It's believing. It's removing the barriers and hindrances to spiritually mature and grow and feed. Why? Because that's where my flesh is going to be manifested healed. Transformation in my physical body is going to come from medicate, 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 medicate. And then stop, stop negating the medicine by the carnality of choice. Flesh. God's word is spirit and it takes our spirit to illuminate that truth to our mind. See, as I feed on that word, it deposits into the soil of my heart. The Holy Spirit will germinate that, bring revelation to my awareness in my mind, and I will speak it. And those words bring life and change into my body. All of that is the spiritual process of health. Now let's just stop all the carnal parts working at the same time where I continue to eat and run my mouth and hate people and don't walk in love. No, let's stop this stuff so that this stuff produces. Are you all following the path here? All right, I'm, I'm trying to make it as simple as possible. There are two things constantly going on when it comes to sickness. What your body is doing and what God has done about it. And i got to live in this truth so this truth changes. And you know what I have found in my situation? Healing didn't manifest in some supernatural way because I meditated and prayed and studied and because I disciplined my flesh. God began to speak. His word became alive. And in that truth, I saw what I needed to do differently. And when I changed that behavior, health appeared. Many of us, that's how healing shows up. It's simply don't quit, let go. I know I have seen healing in my life by forgiveness. I've forgiven somebody. I've actually went beyond that step of forgiveness because the same scripture said, now I want you to sow into them. Not only did I have to forgive them, I had to bless them. 
Now, you talk about hard on flesh. And I remember vividly telling myself when I drove to their house, flesh, I want you to pay attention. I am purposely not listening to you right now. You are not going to steal my obedience and my joy. I am going to do this in an obedient act of love. Because I understand love, because I've meditated on love. Love is not a response. It is a decision, a choice I make. And in doing so, my body changed. You know what else I found out? Some of my finances started to change too. And I never connected the two. But the Holy Ghost did. And because I decided to just get in the Word instead of being mad about it, God gave me the thing I needed to do. And you know what? I don't, in hindsight, I see it very clearly, but in that moment, I don't think I really connected. This is my way to healing. I just knew so strongly I needed to deal with this. That when I went and dealt with it, things started to change in me. Even though I was still standing on the word for healing, it actually came through that obedience. And it just, it just appeared. It was as I went. I just went on living life, and there was something different in me because that thing that was hanging on me, I let it go, and I dealt with it, but I also gave it to God and the word that I had had in my heart. Are y'all following me? It changed me. That's what I'm talking about tonight. Jesus is the word, and he existed in spiritual form long before any words were inspired by the Holy Ghost or written down. Jesus has always been. I'm simply trying to remind you in that statement that there is no but to the things of the Spirit. Boy, we love to conditionalize. You don't understand, Pastor. Oh, I understand that Jesus was Jesus long before your problems. And he knew exactly what to do about your problem when he went to hell. Okay, so let's stop blaming and finding excuses and rationalizations and justifications. And let's recognize that a lot of the things in our physical body are a result of what we abide in. In our carnality instead of the word. Hebrews 4.2 For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith. They all heard it, notice that, in those who heard it. So the gospel was preached, but the word which they heard did not profit. So listen, I want you to catch this. I know I say this a lot. I, are you listening? Are you listening? Are you listening? The key is in hearing. They both heard There is no excuse. If you're listening, there is the potential for you to have it. You can profit when you hear. How? Mix faith with it. Some people will hear the same thing for 20 years, but never mix faith with it. And so it never profits them. They know it. They can quote it. They even have it written down, but they don't. Believe it. And without faith, there's no profit for you. These kinds of sermons, I could preach healing every sermon 150 times a year. It's about the average amount of sermons I preach in a year. 150 to 170 messages. And out of those, I could preach every one of them on the same sermon, and you still not hear it. I mean, you heard it, but you didn't, you didn't mix faith with it. My dad preached my whole life in my life. There were sermons he preached. I could preach while he was preaching it. I heard that sermon so many times. I could, oh, he's going here. Here's his next point. I I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. Just because of the repetitiveness of it. But you know, it took me to be a complete grown adult before I ever actually believed it for myself. I just latched on to him as my dad. But there came a place when I had my own wife and my own kids and my own thing that 
All that stuff I knew my whole life, finally I did something with it. So I'm just going to keep preaching the same things over and over and over. Of course, the crowd turns over. But more importantly, there will be that day where it stops being a herd sermon and it starts being mixed with some faith. And of course, I'm believing God that every sermon has that somewhere in someone. Romans 8, chapter 10. I'm going to stop here. Romans 8, 10. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then He who raised Christ from the dead will also do what? Give life to your mortal body. A body who He's telling us up here is dead because of sin. So the key to dealing with a dead body It's not dealing with a dead body. It's dealing with the life in Christ. Let the life and the spirit of Christ deal with the dead body. Because Jesus, whose spirit was raised from the dead, dwells in me. who, Who raised Christ Jesus from the dead? The Father God spoke it, but who did the work? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit raised Jesus. The Holy Spirit is always the creative force of God. God says it, exercising and releasing authority, but the Spirit does it. And that's where does he live? He lives in me. So that power of God who, who needs to be released and spoken into to do lives and dwells in me. He who raised Christ from the dead will do what? Give life to my mortal body. That's this fleshly thing. How? Through his spirit. And where is his spirit? Where is it? So why are we asking him in heaven to heal us? The life for our mortal body is in the spirit that lives in me. It lives in my born again spirit. His spirit lives in me. So why am I spending all this energy on trying to make my body something? Why am I constantly addressing my body? Why am I dealing with my body? Please don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying to neglect your flesh. Don't bathe. Don't exercise. Who cares what you eat? The body's dead anyways. Sure enough, it will be. You live like that. I am not preaching that. I am not. Please don't go home and throw your medicine out. I am not saying that. I am saying, what are we putting our faith in? What are we exercising our efforts on? We spend more energy caring for our flesh than we spend in the Word, in the Spirit. And the life that body needs is in the Spirit. It's in Jesus. It's in the spirit that lives in me that raised him from the dead. Hallelujah. So tonight, we got to make a decision. we got to make a choice. What are we going to do with our life? How about we stop waiting on somebody to pray for us? And I want to pray for you. James 5 tells me to pray for you, to anoint you with oil, to pray the prayer of faith. I would be a fool not to do that. But... I'm not talking about this moment at 8.10 on a Wednesday night. I'm talking about tomorrow. I'm talking about in the morning when your typical aches and pains start talking. I'm talking about tomorrow night when you ate too much dinner and you're in a food coma. I'm talking about those bad choices you made when you went out and had fun and did something you shouldn't and, you know, moved a little move you should have done in your 20s. All right, and now you have muscle pain and ache pain and this thing and that thing. You're, you're just, by God, I'm getting in these shoes, ladies, and you can't walk the next morning. You know those things. Come on. We all think we look great in our own mirror, and then we get to the restaurant, and we're like, who let me out of the house looking like this? You know what I'm talking about? Those moments right there. What's the words? What am I abiding in? What am I meditating on? This can't just be a church thing. This has to be a lifestyle change. And all those people in my life who don't like it, well, they can watch from the outside when they see my life transformed by the power of God's Word. When they see my mortal flesh 
responding to the life of God on the inside of me because I chose to abide in the Word and instead of the carnal life that I have. I'm not going to let this ache and pain dictate my terms. I will live and not die. I am made whole. I will thrive in this world. I, my mortal flesh has no choice but to respond to what Christ is in me. And that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about awakening God in us. He's already awake. Believe you and me, he is ready to do in you what you are willing to do for yourself. And that's the key to spiritual healing, living a life of the Spirit. Did you get anything? Let's stand tonight. I want to take a moment to pray for you. I don't have any particular words of knowledge, but if you need hands laid on you, if you're fighting any sickness, I want to pray for you tonight. And I want you to leave here healed and set free if that's you. <clears throat> you don't need a piano or a guitar. You just need to make a decision. Thank you for coming up, though, guys. But if you need hands laid on you, get up here and let me do it for you. We're going to pray the prayer of faith. We're going to get in agreement together. This, this a point of contact that's laying on of hands. That is just a place where your faith connects to mine. That's what the woman with the issue of blood did. When she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I'll be made healed. And then Jesus said, it's your faith that did it. You know why? Jesus is the healer. And when I decided that I'm, I'm getting healed, that, that's why we do prayer cloths. That's why we do the laying on of hands. As I lay hands on you guys, you're going to receive it as I release it. Or not, but it's up to you. It's, you're the woman with the issue of blood. And I'm certainly not Jesus, but I'm standing in the place and releasing faith. And you're going to leave here healed see things start changing. And do what the leper did. Remember when the lepers got healed? Only one came back. What did he do? Thank you. That's what you do when you walk out this altar. Thank you, I have it. Where's the rest of them? They were just going and doing what Jesus said. Jesus said, go tell. But he came back grateful. He left with a grateful spirit. Man, that is so powerful in receiving. That grateful attitude. I have it. I don't care what I feel or see. And it said, as he went... So when he came back and said, thank you, still looked like a leper. Because it was as he went, he was made whole. The rest of them got healed. He was made whole. Their grateful spirit, he received what Jesus did. They just took it. This is why a lot of people lose their healing. They come up here and they'll take it, but they won't receive it. You're not going to do that tonight. I know that because I'm preaching to you. But I'm telling you. The life of God is true. It is not changeable. It's not inconsistent. It's not moody and temperamental. Well, the weather's bad. Maybe it's not. No, it ain't got nothing to do with it. It's you and God. Amen. Father, in the name of Jesus, the rest of us, let's raise our hands and worship the Lord. Amen. Father, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God.
Praise God. God is good. Amen. Please listen to me. We're going to shift gears the next couple weeks, and we're going to talk about angels on Wednesday night. I was going to do it Sundays, but the, the Lord rearranged some things. So for the month of December, we're going to spend some time talking about the work of angels. You know, angels are a big deal at Christmas time, but they're not decorations. There are specific jobs angels have to do. And we're going to talk about that over the month of December, so keep coming back. But why I'm telling you that is hold fast to what you've heard. Don't let your symptoms start giving you all the buts and reasons, because that's what happens when you hear these things. The devil comes immediately to steal the word. And he doesn't do that with some demonic force. He does it with thoughts, reasonings, people. The doctor's report. Hold fast. Hold fast to that which you've heard. Don't let when the what a David Engel song? When the devil comes knocking, answer it back with a Bible quotation. Don't let your mouth put you away. Don't let your own mouth do all the work of taking apart every truth you got. Hold fast to the truth. Amen. Jen, come on up. Father, in Jesus' name, we just pray a blessing over these men and women. Thank you. For the revelation we've heard tonight we receive it into our heart father and it will take deep root pressure issues of life won't pull it up oh it won't be choked out by the cares of this world no 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 we let it plant deep and it will be watered by the words of our mouth by faith and meditation on your word we choose tonight to be abiders in love with you And to cast aside the cares and distractions. We choose tonight to lay those things aside. Satan, I rebuke your influence. The influence of others and those that would try to help us pick it back up. We won't tonight because we made a quality decision. And for those we prayed for, we just thank you, Father, right now for their healing manifest. Life and health is flowing through their mortal body by your Holy Spirit. Transformation in life. Wholeness and health is theirs in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Praise God. Jen, we'll let you finish.